Super bubbles can really wipe you out like 1929 did. And uh, that's where we are now. I think the peak of crazy is behind us. We're now in the buy the dip mode, which the super bubbles specialize in. You don't have two years of buying frenzy, dying overnight. Even in 1929, you had some magnificent rally. Buy the dip is the watchword of practically every brokerage house out there. And it always is. You never almost have a major brokerage house say, the game's over, guys, I duck. It doesn't happen. The commercial imperative is overwhelming to stay bullish. It's how you make money. The trend line being slightly generous is 25. And most of the great bubbles, the super bubbles, go below trend and stay there for quite a while. In the Greenspan era, that tendency stopped. In 2000, yes, the Nasdaq came down 82%. It was fairly brutal. Amazon came down 92 But the Federal Reserve raced to the rescue so loudly and strongly that they stopped the decline in the S&P. A trend line. It only declined 50%. 50% is a big decline, but it was only enough to get it back then to trend. This time trend is at most 2,500. And I would expect, even if the Federal Reserve tries to do the same, it will be hard to prevent the market from declining to that level. And of course, it declined very quickly 50% in 1929. It declined 50% in three years in 2000. And the housing market, which was another great American super bubble, went all the way back to trend. Jeremy, it's one thing to predict a collapse in stock prices. It's another altogether to tell investors they should sell. Should they? As I said a year ago, I think they'll do pretty well at buy selling. I'm sympathetic to how difficult it is to get out entirely out of equity. And I would point out, as I did last year, that there are less overpriced parts of the equity market around the world. In fact, everywhere is less overpriced. The US is the peak of this bubble as it was in 2000. And what it meant then is what it will mean today. And that is the US will decline a whole lot more than the rest. It's also true that the value end of spectrum as opposed to the growth end is about as cheap as it gets. So if you can combine those by buying value stocks outside the US, I would say particularly emerging markets, but there's quite a few countries, Japan, the UK, if they're overpriced, they're only moderately overpriced. The US is not moderate. It is shockingly. Given where things are and your level of certainty, would you short an index? Would you short tech stocks? Would you short the S&P 500? We are indeed short a decent amount of Russell 2000. We haven't been hurt in the last year, which we're also short uh, about half as much again in the NASDAQ, which did hurt us, but not sensational. In any case, I would never short, but only short. And the indices I would short, personally, if I was up for that, would be the Russell 2000, because they have a high density of flaky companies that aren't making any money, and the NASDAQ, which also has a high percentage of companies not making it at all. What makes the NASDAQ more complicated is it has these remarkable FANG stocks in it. That makes life complicated. What if I'm a long-term investor, and I look at history, and history tells me that over time, independent or including crashes, stocks deliver a handsome return. And if I just stay in the market, I'll get that return, whether it's 7% or 8% or 9% or 10% over time. Yeah, if you uh, could set your dial for 50, throw the key away, that might make some sense. But let me remind you that in 1929, you didn't get back in real terms until about 1984. That's a long wait. In 2000, you didn't get back for 13 years. By modern standards, that's a pretty long wait. And uh, in Japan, which is really the granddaddy of both bubbles, land and stocks, they are not back to their 1989 today. That is a very, very long wait. So if you think you can stand it for 10 or 20, even 30 years, my guess, but history says a lot of you will not stand. A lot of you will become more conservative deep into this kind. We have a relatively humble measure of success, and that is at some future date, if you got out when I said get out, you will be glad. It doesn't mean you won't suffer in the meantime, but at some future date, be glad. That worked in Japan. We were very early. But if you'd gotten out when we got out and you'd suffered as the Japanese market went up, would still have made and saved a lot of money on the round trip. The same in 2000. We were basically recommending that you ease up on U.S. equity by mid-98. And that was a hell of a rally. And that was brutally painful. But it was still a level where you made tons of money. By 2002, the market was much lower than if you can execute the strategy that I described, there is a really respectable chance that you will make money. You say that the bubble has further inflated into a super bubble. What's the difference between a standard bubble 
and a Super Bowl. You have a price series of the S&P. You can calculate a trend. Statistics 101 is not difficult. And you can work out how far away from trend you are. And a two sigma is the kind of deviation that should occur every 44 years. And because we're a little wilder and less efficient than we should be, it occurs every 35 years. It's not bad. It was a little closer than I expected back then. But uh, every 35 years feels about right. One a career, twice a lifetime. That feels like a pretty decent definition of a bubble. And a three sigma should occur every 100 years. Now we, as I like to say, we do crazy pretty well as a species. So they occur much more, two or three times more often than they should. They're out of kilter much more than two sigma. So two sigma, you can have some fairly standard bubbles. They give you a certain amount of pain, 30, 40, 50% pain. Super bubbles can really wipe you out like 1929 did. And uh, that's where we are now. We entered a few months ago into three sigma territory, super bubble territory. And the other great risk is last year, we also entered bubbles in real estate. This is a very dangerous year. Then. If the super bubble bursts, as you predicted, well, what happens to the economy? What does history tell us? Some bubbles are very specialized to U.S. growth stocks, like 2000. And they hurt. There is a wealth effect. People lose money, they pull back on their spending. But they don't hurt anywhere near as much as when you combine that with a housing bubble. So in 2008, where we had the only housing bubble in American history, that burst and the stock market came down 50% in sympathy. Then you're talking serious damage to the economy through the income effect. Because this time we have, as a multiple of family income, U.S. housing suddenly is more overpriced than it was ever in the housing bubble of 2006 to 2008. And they got there this last year, the biggest increase, 20%, that the U.S. housing market index has ever had has taken it to a new high. And they are, in the U.S., still much cheaper than Canada, Australia, New Zealand, London, Paris, etc. So that is a global event that could cause enormous pain. So we have a housing problem. We have a stock market bubble like 2000. We have overpriced commodities. Oil is 88. And uh, we have, of course, the lowest real rates. Now you have a much higher ratio of debt to GDP. You have much more debt on the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve, and you have much lower rates. I haven't written about inflation for 20 years. When I did quarterly letters, I never featured inflation. I didn't think it was on the radar screen. It is now on the radar screen. It's not that inflation will go roaring back to 1972 or 1982. It's that it will always be part of the discussion from now on, in my opinion. Instead of forgetting about it, it will be spiking and irritating and falling back, spiking again. It will be part of the scenery in the way it used to be in the second half of the 20th century. There's a lot about this economy, I think, that we dragged back in late 20th century. We've had a very, very abnormal honeymoon Goldilocks period for 20 years, which I think is ending. Let me put it this way. We're in the early stages of running out of raw materials. Of course, we live on a finite planet. There's only a certain amount of cheap oil, cheap nickel, cheap copper, and we are beginning to hit some of those boundaries. And we're going to have bottlenecks here, there, and everywhere. The food price index, the UN, is about as high as it gets. A growing food is not getting easier. Climate change is coming with heavy floods, serious droughts, and higher temperatures. None of these make farming. So we're going to live in a world of bottlenecks and shortages and price spikes, and we have to get used to it and learn to manage our way around it. Commodities have a long history of doing quite well when inflation picks up, for obvious reasons. And inflation is quite likely to pick up. Looking out into the future, it is pretty clear that we are running out of labor. Fertility rates have dropped like a stone. China is reeling from the shock of finding that it has 10.8 million babies last year. It's only the other year, seven or eight years ago, it had 20. And uh, this means absolute certainty that the cohorts of 20-year-olds coming into the workforce are smaller going forward. Everywhere, everywhere in the developed world, we're below replacement fertility. The Federal Reserve is confident that it can contain inflation with a series of incremental rate hikes. What do you think? I think the Fed absolutely does not get the pain that's involved with a bubble breaking. You can see that in the history of the last 50 years. And what have we learned? We just went straight back into the game, overstimulating, pushing the rates down, down and down they have gone for 50 years. So they started at 16% on the long bond, and now the real return you would get is minus two. They act as if a low rate is a panacea and comes with no downside. That is clearly nonsense. It's created, I think, the biggest evil in our society, and that is inequality. 
if you drive up the price of assets systematically, and it's bound to happen if you drive the rates down to negative territory, who do you make money for? You make money for the people with assets. Who owns the assets? The top 1% has 35% of all the assets. The top 10% have practically all the assets. What's the asset ownership of the bottom half? A rounding error, a practically none. So you mark up the assets, and that's your contribution to society. What you're doing is pushing down on labor, pushing down on the bottom half, with no offset from increasing their assets since they have them. And you're making the top 1% ineffably rich. And the data bears that out right down to the last two years, when the top 0.1% has doubled its wealth during COVID. And the bottom 50%, I can assure you, has not doubled. If we do not address rising inequality, we will be in real trouble. We are the least equal society, measurably, in the developed world. It's a poisonous. I'll tell you what I think about the and that is the green will turn out to the subset of a bigger, more comprehensive, and that is, the speaking, living within our. We have simply shot way beyond the long-term capacity of the planet to deal with. And one of the problems is waste. And this is not just climate change and greenhouse gases, but of course, plastic. It's also poison. We generate so many toxic chemicals that there is strong indication the planet is really not uh, conducive to life. We are killing off our insect life. We're killing off all manner of animal life. The world can do just fine without Homo sapiens, but it can't deal without insects because of a cascade effect. All the little critters that eat insects, all the birds that eat insects, all the amphibians, etc. And they begin to go out of business. And then the things that need them and plants that need them to be fertilized, one thing after another goes out of business. And so nature is beginning to fail. And in the end, if we don't fix that, we begin to fail as well. And we see that in the toxicity. Now. Human fertility is going to hell. We have one third of the sperm count that we had at the end of World War II. This is not impressive. Mostly we were over-engineered, so we get away with it. But in the last 20 years, we've gone from young couples needing help around the area to maybe 15% of every young couple in the U.S. now needs help. And that's a more or less a global problem. So green investing isn't just a way to make money, it's an existential necessity. It's an existential necessity, and it's part of a bigger problem, living beyond our means. We use up our resources, we put too much pressure on the natural environment, we poison the natural environment. And uh, in that sense, it's a lot bigger issue than climate change writ small. Before we continue, help us clicking that YouTube like button and subscribe now to our channel. This shows the algorithm that you valued this information. And it helps us spread that message. Sharing is caring. And now, let's continue. Do you want to know one thing about crypto? I made over 3000% in profit in a few weeks. Fact is, the traditional financial system, the traditional money system makes you poor, not rich. If you want to earn 500,000, 1 million dollar, you have to wait until you're 50, 60, 70 in the traditional financial system and you probably will still be broke and you will be old. This is not a sexy combination as you can imagine. But the question is, how can you start in crypto and make these profits? Where to invest? Where do you start? My name is Gunnar and I'm from Germany as you can hear and things are a little bit different in Germany. More about that later on. The fact is, there are lots of different cryptocurrencies. It's a gigantic universe where beginners and professionals get easily lost. But there is light at the end of the tunnel. There are seven key steps you need to follow to become successful in this market. You have to know them and if you fail one of them, it's literally impossible to succeed in this market. Just an example, one of the key points is your exchange and one of the biggest are for example Binance and Coinbase. These are trusted and well established exchanges but, and this is a big but, you won't find the super profitable coins on those exchanges. The unknown super profitable coins that get gigantic profits are not traded on those kind of exchanges. They are traded on much smaller insider platforms that are barely known. And I can tell you what those super secret exchanges are and why they are so profitable. And another super important thing are the right information sources. The point is, the internet is gigantic. There are hundreds and hundreds of YouTube channels, blogs, pages and much, much more. And there are also market makers and influencers. For example, Elon Musk, he is not a crypto guy, but the moment he recommended Dogecoin, it went through the roof, to the moon so to say. But why did he recommend it? Where did he hear it from? He didn't hear it from newspapers. 
And believe me, he is listening to someone. But you have to know who and you have to react before he is reacting. This is really, really important. And these are only two of the seven steps you have to follow in order to be successful in crypto. And if you want to know all of these steps in much more detail, and if you want to have a comprehensive checklist, here's what you should do. There is a link below this video. Click on this link and you will get the opportunity to subscribe to my channel. Click on the link and you will see a video where I explain the next steps. So see you soon. Click on the link now. I'll see you there.